Okay, Jeff, welcome. Great to meet you. Yeah, great to finally connect uh, live, huh? Yes, love it. So tell me a little bit about who you are, uh, what you currently do. Well, <laughs> that's a trick question. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. I've always loved IT and uh, I've always been in gaming, love gaming. And uh, I've always been good at building virtual teams. Even before I really started working, I remember I used to go and uh, I, used to, I used to play video games competitively and I'd always have like a team, like I'd build a team competitively. And that's kind of what I've built my whole career around is just building remote teams and, and building brands around that. And uh, it's been really fun. I, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called vastaffer.com, uh, which is a virtual assistant company. We have 170 uh, team members there. Um, I also am a uh, founder of a branding agency called brandedmedia.io. And my business partner who runs the show there, her name's Trisha LeConte. She's awesome. Um, and then I have my little passion project called the Crypto Gaming Team, which I just released a book called the Zero to Hero Crypto Guide. And uh, for those of you who are just listening in and not watching the video, I'm actually Binance swagged out right now, which is uh, <laughs> one of the crypto, exchange, uh, crypto exchanges slash uh, centralized exchanges. Um, and for me, I've just been having a lot of fun building teams and things with people that I enjoy working with. And that makes my life feel very good. Well, thank you. Um, let's start with the topic of teams. Um, so we'll go into, you know, building the teams, but uh, when did you start your entrepreneurial journey and why? Whew. Wow. I've always kind of had like a side hustle you know, kind of always had a side hustle. Um, when I was in high school, I worked at a computer store for free just to learn computers and had a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And in college, I always had a full-time job working as a IT guy for somebody. And then I started my little company just on the side you know, not really making a whole lot of money, just building websites and things for people like, you know, and I sucked at it. So basically I would just go online. I would like buy a website template in HTML, edit it in Dreamweaver and say, here you go. <laughs> um, Even though then, you said it, you probably learned valuable lessons, right? As you oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's just... Uh, it's very interesting how I finally, you know, when I finally got like a real awesome job, I was an IT coordinator for a school district. And then after that, I became a, a project manager, an IT project manager for a Fortune 500. And I always liked building virtual teams on the side to do stuff. And when I started realizing that maybe my corporate job didn't value me and didn't really care about me as much as I had wanted them to. I finally got the hint that I was kind of stuck. Uh, I started thinking maybe my, maybe my side hustle could be my main hustle. And that's, uh, that's what happened. I took the leap February 29th. It was leap day of 2016. I took the leap of faith and started my own business and left my cushy six figure day job uh, to make basically no money and move in with my grandpa. <laughs> but you and, had confidence uh, in yourself, it sounds like. You know what? I don't think I did. I don't think I had a lot of confidence in myself. I just knew that I hated my, I was just miserable at my work and it was worth it to me. That that pain was greater than you know, you, you know, having to go through that. Right. So exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that's basically what happened. And I took my chances and I ended up heading to the Philippines um, to build out my team, which is where most of my team are at in the Philippines right mm -hmm. now. 
uh, and that's that. To, yeah, that's um, that's a good start. I mean, maybe not an ideal start, but everybody has their own start. Um, talking about confidence, so as you said, you didn't have much confidence, but you had a lot of pain point in your current job, which was a good, well-paying job. What um, what helped you gain that confidence as you made that transition? Hmm. I think I had the scale, you know, I, it was like, was the money really worth it living a life with a job that didn't allow me to be with my family that didn't with people that didn't care about my mental health, um, didn't care about my family mainly mm -hmm. and maybe it would be easier if i just started over and i started planning out <laughs> how long could i survive and you know as a w2 employee you don't really have to worry about your next paycheck you know it's coming in so i had to think about like what would life be like without a paycheck every two weeks you know mm -hmm. That was a hard thing to digest, but you know, as a thirty-something-year-old man with a three-year-old kid and a wife moving in with their grandparents, wasn't exactly the most uh, amazing feeling. But you, sadly, mm -hmm. it felt a lot better than the way I was treated at my job. I mean, you had the courage to take the next step, right? Not knowing necessarily how predictable it was going to be. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so once you made that um, transition, how did you, uh, you were, you know, in high school or, you know, in your earlier uh, career, you, you did the side hustle. So did you kind of fall back on that experience to say, these are the side hustles I had, how can I 10 exit? to make it my permanent, you know, full-time income. How did you, how, how did your thought process develop? Yeah, see that, that's what's interesting is when I left, my side hustle VA staffer, <laughs> it wasn't really profitable at the time. And I was like, man, to be profitable, I really need to like get my stuff together. And I hired a consultant in the Philippines who knew a little bit more about the culture and I guess just how to get more results out of the people I was working with. And uh, she was really smart. Um, and I remember thinking, man, I can't even afford this right now, but I couldn't afford to, to not be profitable, even worse, right? So uh, I ended up taking my wife and my three-year-old kid and going to the Philippines for a whole month just to build it all out. And uh, oh, by the way, it was in May. And let me tell you, in May, it is like burning hot summer in the Philippines. Yes. It's definitely, if you want your family to have a good memory, don't take your kids there. Don't take your family there in May. Uh, it was so scorching hot, basically. Um, it was... When I was in the corporate world, um, I went to Manila for two weeks. I don't remember exactly what time of the year, but uh, it, it's so beautiful. You know, uh, there's so much to see. Uh, people are friendly, you know, great to work with. Yeah. Would like to go back. So I'll make a note of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, January, February, really great time to go. <laughs> Perfect. So when you went to uh, Philippines, uh, did you know anybody there that you could connect with right away or how did that develop? Yeah, I had some team members that have worked for me for like a year or so. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I, I do like, I do calls with them. Mm -hmm. So we do Zoom and I had been back. I wouldn't say like two, two or three times I had gone to the Philippines just myself to like, build some stuff out like two times before that. Um, but this was the first time where I went for like a whole month of just like 
I'm here and I'm getting stuff done, brought the whole family with me. It was a hell of an investment at the time. Mm -hmm. um, my kid, my, my son, who's now 10, by the way, it's crazy how time flies but he was three when that happened and he loved it over there. You know, it's like an adventure every day you get on the Jeep knee, which is basically <laughs> this like stretch Jeep that's all open and you just go in there and you just tell, you know, you pay like 25 cents worth of, of money to take a ride on somebody or you go in a trike or whatever. Like it was like an adventure for him. He loved it. And uh, you know, he always wants to go back, you know, 10 it's years later, he still asked me. Adventure and education, I would say, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, really educational. I think it's important to have, you know, that, uh, you know, I know that you traveled and stuff. So like, it's important to have that different viewpoint of the world, you know, like, I feel like Americans don't even know how life is so easy over here, you know, we take a lot of things for granted, for sure. You know, uh, yeah. when I visited Africa and different countries, uh, back in uh, 90s, you know, we, we wouldn't have electricity or water at times. So, you know, it made me realize, you know, <laughs> not to take things for granted. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think traveling is, uh, is, a, is a great investment and we have become a global, global team now, right? Um, anything we do, uh, I think we have to interact with our colleagues or customers uh, or even our workers in different time zones and countries. Would you, would you agree? Yeah, I agree. And I think that's one of the, one of the important things that have to be navigated when you, when you build a remote team is like, you know, your communication plan uh, and the time zones and understanding different cultures, right? Like these are all things that are super important when you build a remote team, especially international team. Um, you know, I feel like one of the reasons why I hire from the Philippines is because culturally they have a lot of alignment with Americans, you know, um, and they love American movies and their national language is English and it's just easier. And because the call center is booming over there so much, uh, they usually speak really great English. And, um, you know, there's a real huge shortage not just in America, but worldwide, especially in Western countries, and just having people that are committed and dedicated to you. And because I feel like there's this new, ironically, because this business was my side hustle, that that's, that's the thing now. Like nobody wants to be committed to a job. Like they all want to have a side hustle. They all want to do their own thing. They all want to be entrepreneurs. They want to own a business or whatever. And like, there's so much value in just having people that really care about you and want to grow with you and your company. And that's something that so many people miss out on. Like I couldn't have grown my business if, you know, like the way that it is, if people didn't care about the business and just didn't see themselves here, you know, for the foreseeable future. I think that's an excellent point. So to develop that loyalty or love of your business, right? What are some things that you found with your experience that has really helped you bring your employees together to be loyal to you or to give your company their best? Yeah. Uh, first off, you have to make sure that things are in alignment, right? Um, I feel like a lot of times people hire people for a certain role and then they give them a bunch of other things and then they don't like those other things and they finally just like, okay, I don't like this job anymore. <laughs> so like you have to make sure that people really enjoy the things that they're doing, number one. Uh, number two is you have to make sure that you're treating your people good uh, and that they actually can see growth potential in the company. Number three, you as the leader have to be somebody that they want to follow. Like think about how many people would love to just go work for Elon Musk because he's Elon Musk. Like if you want people to be interested in you, then you need to be interesting. Mm -hmm. Those are great points. I think uh, any founder CEO uh, have come across that challenge, but uh, you know, in addition to your points, I think just being authentic leader also helps, you know, which, um, you know, sounds like you are one. 
as authentic as we can be. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that, you know, this is actually, uh, I just got done speaking about this with a friend earlier today. Um, it's very challenging. It's very challenging to open up as an entrepreneur, especially around failure, because people want to work with successful people. And it's not easy to admit failure um, and deal with the backlash of judgment to deal with the backlash of, I mean, think about mental health, man. Like we've literally been told lies for years about COVID and all sorts of crazy stuff that's finally coming out now. Um, We've had governments that have used it to control people, to change voting rights, to change all sorts of stuff. And it's great. The the thing is crazy part is I used to be thinking, dude, these people are conspiracy theorists. What are they, you know what I mean? And now like, (laughs) not to get on the political rant here, but now we're finding out a lot of the stuff is true. Now the reports are coming out showing that you actually have more of a chance to having uh, a, 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 a side effect, a negative side effect from the vaccine than you would just getting the damn virus in general. So yeah, and, to your point, uh, you know, earlier about uh, failure, I mm-hmm. think that's such a important point, right? Because yeah. I think if you look at anybody, any successful leader, they've had failure, right? I don't... It, in my opinion, you cannot have success without failure. Mm. And so, you know, you talked about Elon Musk. I mean, talk about failure. I mean, he almost went bankrupt, right? And then it just kind of, you know, with the SpaceX. Uh, and then certain events occurred and, you know, he, he became successful. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's uh, very important to recognize the failures, but more importantly, what are the lessons that we learn from them, right? So it's like an education. It's like a degree, uh, you know, whether you, you know, master's, bachelor's degree, we go to college, but oftentimes college doesn't really prepare us for entrepreneurship or uh, developing a business. But, you know, having those failures and if we can take those lessons from it and change our path, I think oftentimes there there is success at the end of the road. Mm. However, we design this, de, how, however we define that success to be, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So I think you know in your life it sounds like you have three verticals right now. So you have a successful um, executive assistant uh, type of a business, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We have been talking about. Um, le- So I'll kind of leave it up to you. So let's talk about, you know, so through perseverance, through your own skills, you developed that business and it became successful at some point, correct? (laughs) Yeah, at some point. (laughs) (laughs) At some point. And it sounds like you've had your share of failure. I know I have, but it sounds like you had your share of failures too, but ultimately you had the success. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean... I just found out that uh, I just got interviewed by uh, a writer for Business Insider and they're doing a they're doing a feature article about the journey that I was on to start VA staffer and uh, just how just, you know, some it's 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 interesting because I will tell you just a lot of the success that I've experienced is just because of timing, Mm -hmm. you know. And uh, it wasn't like I meant to do it. It's just remote teams is something that I did. I did remote teams before remote teams were cool. And, you know, with the onslaught of, you know, the, the pandemic, remote teams became something that, that pretty much everyone needed to survive, you know, in the business landscape. And, uh, you know, before 2020, I used to have to convince people why they should hire remote teams. I never have to have that conversation. I've never had since since January, February of 2020. I've never had that conversation, not once. But I used to have it on a daily before. Yeah, the um, world has certainly changed in so many ways, right? Uh, so timing, I think, to your point, timing was, you know, to your advantage in a way, even though we went through this, you know, horrible two years or so, uh, but everything went... Pretty much everything went remote, 
right? So there was a need to build teams. Uh, let's talk about a little bit about the services that you provide through the VA uh, staff that you have. Yeah. So for me, uh, you know, when I first started VA staffer, I really did everything. I, I hired people to do everything. And I found out really, I wish I could say quickly, I found out over, over a couple of years that if you try to do everything for everyone, you never really do anything right. It's not scalable. So what we really hunker down on is executive assistance. So, you know, people that support leaders. So for example, um, I have uh, an assistant, her name's Jacqueline, and she comes on all of my calls with my clients. She takes meeting minutes. She schedules all the calls. She sends the summary. She follows up on the action items. She does my to-do list. Um, she's basically my gatekeeper at the company. I saw your post on LinkedIn, by the way. Uh, oh, yeah. Here the kudos. Yeah, excellent. Um, that, that saves you a ton of time. Oh my gosh, so much. Um, and the, the crazy part is, is that she's, it's, it's interesting because I, 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 this is one of the things that I feel as a, as a leader, a lot of times we don't have the patience um, to bring somebody on board because the truth of the matter is when you first hire somebody, that's the least valuable they're ever going to be is the first day, right? Like, they don't know your business. They don't know you. They don't know what's important. They don't know what emails are spam and which ones are important. They don't know anything about you. And it's a learning process. I remember the first couple of weeks, basically, I would wake up in the morning and I would come on to my emails and uh, she would basically be on a Zoom call just like this. And then I would share my screen and I would tell her, okay, this is useless email, trash it. This, this is important, setting up a system. If it's important, market is unread, put a flag by it. That means I have to read it. If you don't know what to do, then I do. Then I'll take care of it, right? And then after a while, she kind of understood what I do and what I, how I would respond to things. So the only times I would ever really need to, you know, something brought to my attention is if it's something that she doesn't exactly know or unclear on what I would do. So the goal is to have somebody who knows what you would do, <laughs> right? Exactly. That's a great case study of what you provide for your customers, right? I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, you're you're your own client in that regard, right? And now you're taking that model and providing it for many others. Yeah, and basically that's my job at the company right now because I I have two people, Nicole and Julio, that are responsible for doing inbound calls. We don't do any outbound sales. It's all referral based or inbound. Uh, so they they do the the clients. I have Isabel who does our hiring, recruiting, managing, training, onboarding of clients. I have RS who manages our creative team. I have Redora who manages the web team. Like I don't really do anything at the company except for one thing, which is showing up on podcasts and showing up and speaking about it on stages and writing content. And even there, sometimes I cheat because I have some, I have some amazing copywriters, yeah. but um, in all reality, <clears throat> that's what I want to instill with my clients. Like I went to Sundance, Utah all last week. I was completely offline. I only had internet for a couple hours a day, like in the morning and at night when we're, we went back to the cabin where they had really bad Wi-Fi. But other than that, I was offline for an entire week. I mean, how many entrepreneurs can go offline for an entire week and their business still run? Matter of fact, I looked at my phone. We, we had a record week while I was gone. <laughs> right. You should take more vacations. <laughs> yeah. Right. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, in the very beginning, it's really hard to trust, yes. you know, like that's something that takes time. Um, but I've also learned as a leader that sometimes you just need to, to literally disappear and like let people go and a you're going to find out the people that actually step up to the game and you're going to find the people that are like oh the boss is gone you know i'm going to skate right um so it's a it's a natural progression of success and i think that that you know 
putting people into the fire and finding out what happens is uh, one of the best things you could do as a leader. Yeah. And, that, you know, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's important for the audience to understand that, you know, that what you just described, it takes time to set that up, right? You probably put in, you know, weeks and weeks of time, training, developing, picking the right employee, right? I'm sure mm -hmm. you, you picked, you know, employee that didn't work out and you had to go through that process, right? That's yeah. kind of like the pain of growing. But after say a year or two, however long it took you, now you're at a point, you can kind of go on cruise control a little bit. Yeah, and I think that that's the number one thing that I hope that I can provide people is just that peace of mind of knowing that someone's there and actually cares, you know? And I feel like not a lot of entrepreneurs feel that way. I feel like most of them feel these main three emotions. One, nobody cares about the business like I do. Number two, no one can do it as good as me. And number three, which is probably the most sad excuse ever is I don't have time. I don't have time. Right. to set up the systems and the people so that my business can run itself. You don't have time to make time. Right. And what you described, you know, with your uh, VA, she saves you a ton of time, right? Yes, initially you have to invest some time to kind of train that person with your specific needs, you know, fine tune certain things, maybe set up, you know, the standard operating procedures, that type of thing. But exactly. after that, it kind of... Um, you know, it, it really goes to your benefit and saves you time in the long run. Yeah. I mean, we can, none of us can do it alone. I mean, to be honest, we all, we, we always need somebody. And to your point, somebody, not just anybody, but somebody who cares and you being a leader, you know, instilling certain values in your employees. It sounds like to me that your employees are trained or you pick the employees who do care right? Or look, they enjoy what they do. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's great. Um, let's talk about your other two verticals a little bit. Um, I, I'll let you pick um, that. So this is one stream of revenue for you, by the way, you know, you're at a point where you kind of see the passive income, right? You don't necessarily have to be on the job every day, right? So some of it is kind of passive income in a way, I, the way I look at it. Um, the way you set things up. So let, let's talk about the other two verticals and how that generates revenue for you. Yeah, well, I think the that's the key. You know, I'm very fortunate the very first company I ever started was a staffing agency um, because that's basically how it is vertical, right? Like uh, it started it started because I realized <laughs> when I first left that entrepreneur, the, the uh, real world, corporate job into entrepreneurship, I found out really quickly that I sucked at sales. Um, I sucked at marketing because I never, I was the project, I was an imp implementation guy. Somebody mm -hmm. from sales sold it and I made it happen, you know? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so from going to the person who's actually like having to sell stuff and, and market it, that was a huge, huge turn for me. I just didn't even know what to do. Um, it was then also when I realized that having a personal brand as a leader was really important. Um, you know, and this is this is one of the activities that I do to continue the brand is get on getting on podcasts and shows and 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 you know making myself visible and and uh, authentic, you know, um, and relatable. You know, I didn't even know how to be relatable to people. You know, like I was a project manager. I, I wasn't, I mean, I understood people's roles and things, but like, I wasn't able to step in their shoes. You know, I didn't know the pain points or anything like that. So uh, I, I hired a coach and uh, invested in some training programs on, you know, how to become more of a more present online. I actually ended up hiring a PR guy in an agency, mm -hmm. which sucked, by the way. Um, it's actually because of this person that I'm not going to name that I spent all this money on back when I didn't have money. I just used a credit card because I didn't have money back then. 
to build my brand. They did a horrible job. They didn't deliver promises they promised. And I, out of desperation, I said, well, at least I know what they said they were going to do for me. So I know like kind of what I need to do. I'm going to find it. I'm going to figure it out myself. I Googled it. I started reading books, how to build a brand, all this kind of stuff. And I said, you know what? I can do this. And a year and a half later, on my own, I built an incredible personal brand all the way through mid-2017. I got my very first speaking gig. Uh, and then the very next year, I was you know, in front of 300 people or so. And then I started getting on podcasts, TV, things like that, just e explaining about virtual teams or remote teams, you know? Mm -hmm. And I started realizing how important it was as a leader to build a personal brand. Other people on my network were like, wow, Jeff, you've really become like the go-to guy in the space. And that was when I realized, oh my gosh, this would be valuable for all my other friends' businesses mm -hmm. to develop themselves as a leader. So that's when I started, and that was in 2018. It was a, an idea from one of my friends and clients, uh, Dennis Yu at the time, uh, he said, Hey, you should really start a branding agency. Like what you're doing is really smart and what you're doing is really great. And, uh, so I did, I started a branding agency that helps leaders become a recognized expert in their space, just like I did. So it's literally like, here's what I did. I can help you do it too. Right. So that's, that's the vertical progression. That's smart. I mean, you had the Jeff blueprint right uh what creates success for you and you made that into a template that you then offer to your clients to help them build their brand which is fun and interesting at the same time yeah uh, it's very fun and i and i just and i love working with people on their brands you know like for me like i've kind of removed myself from va staffer outside of telling people about it it's really fun for me to think about, okay, the brand of someone else. And like, cause I, I, I developed something called the core branding, uh, the core branding method. And I actually reached out and I, I look back on what I wish I would have done in 2016 when I started that business or went all in on that business. Cause I technically started in 2014, but 2016 is when I went all in and I left the corporate job. Um, and the one thing that I wish I had was mentors that have already been there in success so i started thinking about my own faults that i had back then and how i could help jumpstart other people to get into to where they need to be and i started realizing that most branding agencies were just like here's a website here's a logo you know um here's some copywriting what i realized is that there's really key parts that are missing. A, building a deep emotional connection with your audience intentionally. That's what the C of core is. O is omnipresence. Like how are you constantly in front of not everybody, but how are you constantly in front of your target audience, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's podcast, you know, like yours, whether it's uh, entrepreneur.com, which I'm now a contributor to, um, whether it's, you know, being featured in Business Insider, like I said earlier, like that's a dream come true for me. I can't believe it. Um, and then relevance. We talked about relevant, being relevant. How are you relevant to your target audience? And that's really your content strategy, you know? But also something else that people don't think about is how are you relevant to other experts already established in the field? Because you're not an expert until someone who's already an expert says you're an expert. Right. And that brings in opportunities for maybe partnerships or collaboration with other experts in the field, right? Uh, where you could be like co-collaborators, I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Co-collaborators, uh, just like I said earlier, Dennis Yu, he's one of the people who's really strong in personal branding. Um, and uh, Doug Harrison, who... Uh, really helped me out a lot. Uh, he's the guy who came up with the Coca-Cola's happiness campaign. So if you ever seen a Coca-Cola being drank by a polar bear and a penguin, like that's him. He helped come up with that. Mm -hmm. Like these are all mentors of mine that helped me build out who I am. And then I started saying, well, why don't we build out a strategy for other people 
to where here's the expert topics they need to be. We call them the five pillars of expertise. What are your five pillars of expertise? And then who are the people that are already established experts in those fields? And how do we start building relationships with them? Right. So it's a team approach, right? So your client, they're getting you, but they're also getting your co-collaborators. So they're getting a lot more of the expert advice, I would think. Yeah. They're getting everything that I didn't get. <laughs> well, you, you went know, that pain. So yeah. now you know how to address that pain for others. And you're almost saving them from going through that pain if, if you get to, if they come to you at the right time. <laughs> and don't get me wrong. There's lots, of, there is, there is something good to be said about learning, learning things the hard way. Oh yeah. Um, so when it comes to building a personal brand, I can tell you, that's one thing I definitely wish I didn't have to learn the hard way. I didn't, I wish I didn't waste my money hiring someone to do stuff that he couldn't do and whatever it's, and it's funny. I actually wrote a post over the weekend called I'm not your coach. Um, because a lot of people come to me, they're like, Hey, can you coach me? You know, can you coach me on building the brand or whatever? And I'm like, no, I've tried coaching people before. And a, I've learned that I can never be more passionate about something than someone else, especially your own brand. And if I'm giving you, Hey, do this and you don't do it. I take that personally. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when I tried doing coaching over the years, you know, bring on people, you know, even as a mentor, I just felt like what ended up happening was they didn't do it or they didn't have the people to do it or they didn't have the willpower to do it or they just didn't want to do it. And I said, look, instead of paying me to coach you, why don't you pay me and my team to just do it with you? Right. Right. Like I, I'm an execution guy. I'm the project member. I'm the implementation guy. So exactly. I've built the strategy. I'll give you the strategy for free. Right. As long you're as they're motivated. Yeah. As long as they're going to pay me to do it. <laughs> that makes sense to me because as long as they're motivated and they have the take action mindset, I think mindset, as you probably uh, will agree, mindset is huge, right? Unless they're mm -hmm. in the right mindset and have that take action attitude, you know, you can't do it for them, but you can be the guide and you can do it alongside with them. Yeah, exactly. So how, how um, so if an entrepreneur comes across and they have a need for branding, do you have a separate website or a landing page for that? Or yeah. Do you, how, do you, and how do you do that? Yeah, brandedmedia.io uh, is, is that, that brand. And uh, we, I, I basically, I spent a lot of money to put together a free training to explain it all to people. That's I've got cool. like video after video after video of explaining my own journey, uh, telling the story about the guy that I paid 10 grand or whatever to, to do my own brand and he failed miserably. Then I had to figure it out on my own and that whole story. Um, and then I actually get into core, the connection, omnipresence, relevance, and the piece we didn't get to, which is engagement, which is actually having people reach out to you and and the other way around too you reaching out to them a lot of people don't understand like think about the relationship that we've built all from engagement on linkedin yes right engagement is so key engagement is so key because that's the interactions that take that build trust and rapport right something i want to add to that is also how you do it because i get so many messages on linkedin but the way you worded your message to me or, you know, how we communicated, it just stood out. I knew that you were different from others. So kind of distinguishing yourself from others and having that mindset of, I want to provide value first, you know, helps to start that engagement. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Let me ask you a question. Red pill or blue pill? <laughs> Red. <laughs> okay. There's no coming back. <laughs> Just so you know, the red pill means there's no coming back. What I'm about to tell you. Sure, go for what it. What if I told you that the entire engagement that you and I had was my assistant, Jacqueline? Ah, uh, okay. That's yeah. the red pill. Yeah. Now, what if I told you that all of that engagement was a plan that I made three years ago that focuses on building a valuable relationship with my audience? 
fosters value and leading with value first, like you said, right? Mm -hmm. Like before this show even came about, the message, I know exactly what my assistant said because I wrote it. It is me. That's why it sounds like it's so genuine and authentic because I wrote it. Yes. It's, hey, how would you like to, like, I'd love to come on your show if it's valuable to your audience. And we could talk a little bit about delegation. We can talk about leadership. We can talk about, and I give you very specific things, SOPs, right? I call them freedom recipes. Like, we can talk about these things. And do you think that would be valuable to your audience? And you were like, yeah, that would, that sounds great. Let's get you on the show, right? I mean, that goes to um, show how good you are with your training because your assistant kind of knows you so well and what you would reply, right? And and she has to be as close to you and your communication style as possible, right? Uh, And she did come from a place of authentic communication, which is one of your core values, I would think, right? Yeah, it is, Um, it is. Yep, connection, building that deep emotional connection you know like i really and it's and it's by the way it's, there is something to be said about maybe it coming off as inauthentic because my assistant sends it but at the same time i will tell you that as a leader we're very distracted people we're all over the place we've got this we've got that we've got all sorts of things and i know that the best use of my time is not engaging on social media well, I'll tell you, I don't think it's, uh, I, I mean, I, I think it's authentic in the sense that, look, your goal was to provide value, you know, by coming to a podcast, sharing what you know, share some of your failures, and you're able to establish the connection. Now, you and I are talking for about more than 40 minutes. Now, that's real communication, right? So mm-hmm. ultimately, the main goal goal was to have this conversation and yeah. that communication was just kind of like the prelude to that so yeah. to me that's just being more efficient yeah and not to mention you know we originally had scheduled this back in july and oh. here we are august 1st yes um and and by the way i had a family emergency and uh and she and she actually went back because we were already scheduled and she actually reached out to you yes. as me and said, hey, I have a, a family emergency. I'd love to reschedule, offered some some times like, you know, the amount of time that Jacqueline saves me every day is phenomenal. Like that's one of the advantages, by the way, I'd have to say, of, uh, in like my post on LinkedIn that you read of why I know I have an advantage over most people is because I have an assistant who knows how I am, how I would react, how I communicate it. And it's really something that, you know, most people, I don't think most people even understand or, I mean, once they experience it, once you have an assistant who actually is with you all the time and cares about you and and knows your business and knows how you respond, it's like, it's like one of the best life hacks that you've ever had. Because I can literally say, hey, I'm stressed out for the day. Let's reschedule the calls. And I'm done. I'm gone. I'm out. Mm-hmm. Right? You know? Um, and it's just, it's mind-blowing. You know, it, it, it's actually pretty interesting. I One of my clients actually says something negative to me. Negative to me about this. They said, well, Jeff, you're not really like, you know, in the day-to-day of your business or whatever, like you're, you're kind of checked out. I'm like, yeah, I designed it that way. Mm -hmm. You're going to criticize me. They call me the king of outsourcing for a reason. (laughs) Well, ultimately, um, if the goal is being achieved, right, it's whether it's you being involved or not, is really, uh, uh, it's a non-issue, right? Because you put in the time up front to develop these teams to be their best and as close to your core values as possible. So you put in a ton of time and effort into that, I'm sure, right? Yeah. So it didn't happen open overnight. Now your team basically acts as your agent, right? To say, mm-hmm. okay, so you're providing, your clients are being served. So what, what does it matter whether it's you or your team. In fact, it's better if it's your team. You can serve more people, one to you know, you know, one to many. So yeah. now you know, you know the irony though. Go ahead. 
it's also giving better service by having her because her memory is way better than mine. <laughs> so you not only uh, so you kind of add on to her skill sets, right? Things right. That you don't have she has. She she has way better organizational skills than me. <laughs> so so that you know so your clients are getting like double the value really. Right. If you're just getting you, it's now you plus somebody else's skills. I get it. Yeah, exactly. So, so this is great. I mean, I think um, the, what, what you provide for your clients, the, the couple of things we talked about, um, especially if there's an entrepreneur who's kind of growing at this point, uh, like VA is almost a must have. You, ha oh. you have to have somebody you can trust. You yeah. Know, I mean, if you ask most people, you know, what are some of their stressors during the day? I'm sure email is very much at the top of the list, right? All the messages we get bombarded with. Oh, the emails are atrocious. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, in, in all reality, too, I think I think one of the things that 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 uh, people sometimes do not think about um, and this is why I, I always say your first two hires as an entrepreneur should be an executive assistant and a copywriter. <laughs> um, the executive assistant, just because we're usually our own secretary, we're usually doing a lot of things that are just not the most valuable use of our time. We're usually so busy kicking the rocks when we should be the one pushing the boulder. Um, the, by the way, to finish that thought, the copywriters, because a lot of times we're not the best at the marketing message. And it's very important when you're building a brand for your company or for yourself to really have a fine tuned marketing message that, that resonates and is relevant with your target audience so that people can really relate to you and understand what you're trying to do and build that um, emotional connection. Because most of most of our business, most service-based businesses are relationship businesses. And I think through the power of copywriting and storytelling, that's the best way to build relationships. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's a team approach, right? Uh, you need a team of people that you can count on, you know, uh, that can provide you because none of us have all the skills we need as a business owner or an entrepreneur. Uh, as you pointed out. Uh, one thing I do want to ask, you know, some of the people listening who have the need for VAs and others, uh, they may say, well, you know, what about the confidentiality aspect of it, right? Uh -huh. um, so do they usually sign like an NDA or how do you address that? Yeah, we have our team do sign two things. One, an NDA. And number two, an anti-poaching clause. <laughs> <laughs> Because a lot of our clients, they stick with, I mean, we're a permanent staffing solution, not temporary. So once you, like, if you're like, hey, Jeff, I need a VA. And I'm like, yeah, we're, you go through our process. You're like, okay, we find the perfect VA for you. We expect that VA to be with you for life. You know, like that's our matchmaking that we do. We try to make it. It's funny because I see a lot of these VA companies say, oh, no matchmaking, whatever people available right away. Usually that's because they're busy. They're, they're That's because they're juggling multiple clients. So they have people available right away. That's not how we work. We recruit people from technology companies that usually work in call centers, you know, technology, Google, Shopify, Canva, you know, people that are good at problem solving. And then we train them how to be virtual assistants. Mo the problem is wh why most people haven't found a good VA is because they're trying to hire a VA. What we do, it, VAs, by the way, the reason to clarify that VAs are entrepreneurs, most of them. They're entrepreneurs that juggle multiple clients. Mm -hmm. But we have dedicated executive assistants that are from the corporate world. They usually have a two to three year tenure working for some you know, technical support call center. They're usually working six days a week. They're usually getting mandatory overtime, non-paid. And all I do is I say, hey, how would you guys like to make two to three times more than you're making right now? And you get to work from home in your pajamas for some really incredible people only five days a week. It's a good pitch. Excellent. Do you have some type of uh, matrix where you can monitor their performance? Or do the clients have the ability to do that? How does that work? Yeah, so we have a we have a really cool leadership team. So we have 
our main person, Isabel, who just actually sent me a message while we were talking about something else. <laughs> um, and, and then we have what we call squad leaders. So the squad leaders, we have some time tracking productivity type software that our team members on a daily check to see what they call the end of day report, EOD. So we check the end of day report. We're looking for their productivity, making sure that they're getting stuff done. We're making sure that things are going well. We have, we have coaching. So they all have coaching with their managers and their leaders, their squad leaders. Um, we, they have weekly meetings, they have one-on-ones, they have all sorts of stuff. And uh, that's really important. You know, the, the ongoing development is really important. Um, and then we usually do a 90 day evaluation with a client. We get on a call just like this, talk to the client, how are things going? What's, what's a miss? You know, what's going well? How can we improve? Um, so we, we try to be very active in the relationship that those people have, which is another reason why we have the anti-poaching because, you know, it doesn't happen that often, but from time to time, a client will say, okay, well, I'm paying you guys 1500 bucks a month and you guys have a 35 to 40% profit margin. So I can save 30, 40% of my bill if I just hire directly. And I'm like, yeah, you can just pay us $10,000 for the poaching fee. And that VA is yours for life. You never have to th- see me again. Um, it's, it's interesting how some people will sacrifice a long-term relationship for short, short-term game, a short-term game gain. Wow. Uh, so yeah, you know, my goal is, you know, how do we, how do we build relationships with people for life? That's my end goal, whether it's business, personal, whatever. Excellent. It's well thought out, you know, it's a proven business and, you know, it's already providing value to your clients. So it's great to kind of hear from you how you've developed it, how you maintain it, and you nurture. Uh, so very informative. So as we start wrapping up our call, this is this has been a great, uh, great call, by the way, you know, with our interview. Thank you. Really yeah, it has been. You, <laughs> really you've, taken me in, you've taken me in some serious directions I usually don't go, so... Well, you know, that's kind of how I think. I like to just kind of get to know somebody as we spoke about earlier. You know, we kind of getting to know each other. And uh, so that's that's one of the main reasons I enjoy this is everybody has a story. Everybody has a journey. You know, let's go through it and we learn from it. Uh, so, you know, talk about anything that we may not have touched upon so far. And then let's wrap up with, uh, giving the audience where they can go to reach out to you. I know you also mentioned about a book. So maybe you want to touch upon that. <laughs> That's another show for another time. Okay. I'm, I love crypto. I, and I say, by the way, same thing. I got burned on crypto when I first got involved. I lost a lot of money. Okay. So I, I wrote the book that I wish I read before I got involved. <laughs> it's called The Zero to Hero Crypto Guide. It just got released uh-huh. on Amazon uh, last week, five days ago. So if um, you're willing, let's try to do another one as a yeah, follow-up. Absolutely. Just on that. That, yeah. Be awesome. so, uh, so yeah, yeah. Let's go ahead and talk about anything that we may have missed. No. Tell us about how we can reach out to you. Yeah, that was perfect. Uh, if you guys are interested in obviously getting a VA, my shameless plug is just vastaffer.com. Um, but on a more important note, like I said, I'm into the relationships. So I uh, would love to invite you guys to be on this journey. And I want to be on your journey as well. Um, I think we're both on LinkedIn. Follow us. I'm sure you're going to have links on there. I'm Jeff J. Hunter. I just got Google verified and now I'm Twitter verified. So I guess I'm cool now. Uh, <laughs> you're so, one of the cool ones. Yeah. If you go on Twitter and type in Jeff J, I think I'm the first one. I think my username on Twitter is like J the letter J Hunter, J Hunter 101. Um, but yeah, just really enjoy building virtual teams and see what people do with it. And of course, um, you know, I give a lot of free advice because like I said, I'm not your coach. So I give lots of advice to people. I show people how to use a VA. And then the goal is that eventually they'll say, yeah, you know what, Jeff, I would like a VA. And I say, cool, get on a call with my team. 
Yep, Ex excellent. And you're very active on LinkedIn. I follow you there. I see your messages and uh, various topics that you touch on. So uh, Thank you. yeah, so it's, uh, you know, we're going to stay in touch and we're going to be co-collaborators. Uh, yeah, and and let's like talk to... crypto next time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's, where, that, that, that's where I feel is really a fun place to go is the crypto gaming side. Oh, wait until we talk about that, guys. If you want to, you guys better tune into his show and just, just find that episode because it's coming. All right. Yes. Uh, it's going to be called Crypto Gaming <laughs> with Jeff J. Hunter <laughs> right here on the show. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Um, and I will send you a message on LinkedIn that your EA can reply to me. As, as <laughs> yeah, and she'll coordinate it. That's true. Wow. See, uh, now the red the red pill is already taken. So. But I love it. I love it. It's just so it's so good, right? Because it's like me talking to you. And ultimately, once we get on the Zoom, it's the you, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so well, thank you so much for having me, and I appreciate it. And uh I can't wait for the next one. Jeff, thank you. And looking forward to the second part. All right. Talk soon.